Temples formerly dedicated to female deities were rededicated to the Virgin Mary. The horned fertility god, Pan, and the pagan god of living fire, Santan, were twisted into a new and convenient image of fear, Satan. And thus, temples once associated with life-affirming forces came to be associated with a new word, evil. Temples flowing with living energy, symbolized by the dragon, were repackaged with the violent image of the dragon speared by a gallant St. Michael, the former Mikael, pagan archangel of light. These were subtle reminders by the new law that forces of nature, once used for the benefit of humanity, were now subjugated and under the control of a middleman. Despite the abundance of empty land, the church was curiously adamant on acquiring the old temples and erecting its own houses of the holy upon them. One reason is that initiates of the ancient mysteries within the church were well aware that these temples were special. They were not located haphazardly on the landscape, but sat upon strategic points of energy. The clues survive in the language of the buildings themselves. We approach via the entrance. But what exactly is it entrancing? That passageway called the nave, which in Latin is navis, a boat, transports you to the focal point of worship, the altar. But who or what is it altering? Curiously, most church altars were built over a slab of red granite, a rock containing a very high amount of quartz, a formidable conductor of energy. The same technique was used in the focal point of power in temples such as the Great Pyramid of Giza. Interestingly, the rock used for altars was not of local origin. As with the greenstone altar at Stonehenge, it was transported from hundreds of miles away. So it is strange that a religion hell-bent on eradicating any connection with the pagan past should use the exact principles once adopted by the megalithic temple builders. The assimilation of ancient temples continued into the 12th century, and with them the suppression of esoteric knowledge. Then, out of nowhere, emerged a new kid on the block. Colossal, ornate, impressive, and very, very expensive. The Gothic cathedrals appeared virtually overnight across Europe, blossoming like roses across the bleak landscape of the Dark Ages. And all this at a time when war, pestilence and plague were decimating much of the continent. Under such conditions, if you had any sense, you'd get a job working on one of these medieval skyscrapers, which employed the finest craftsmen of the day and took as many as 20 years to build. But who in their right minds would invest such an obscene amount of money under such unfavorable economic and social conditions? These optimists, it turns out, were none other than the Knights Templars. The original Templars were adepts of the Egyptian mystery schools. These academies imparted to their pupils the knowledge and practical application of esoteric sciences, 
such as sacred geometry, the creative effects of sound, and most important of all, the harnessing of subtle energies. But the Templars would not divulge these secrets to those who had every intention of misusing such information, particularly Philip IV of France and Pope Clement V, who coveted the secret knowledge the Templars had gathered. The Order was ruthlessly persecuted by the Holy Inquisition, and many took their secret signs to the grave. But since the knowledge had to be preserved for future generations, the Templars had devised a cunning plan. They placed the information where the clergy was least likely to find it. Right in their very own homes. In designing these hymns to the Supreme Being, the Templars encoded much of their knowledge in the very fabric of the Gothic cathedrals. Their dimensions and spatial relationships are encoded with sacred geometry, and such harmonics produce a concordant effect on the human body because it too is made of similar geometric relationships. A secret formula was used for stained glass, which altered the light of the sun so that the body's skin resistivity to light was subtly altered during the act of prayer. Energy pathways through the building were marked by dragons and other symbolic metaphors, just as Neolithic people had once done in their temples. The floor plans were measured in mathematical units derived from natural laws, and in precise ratio to ancient sacred sites. As for the orientation of the buildings, not only did they reference the old temples, they also aligned to the rising sun at the equinox, when solar energy was at its most powerful. Even the cloisters were designed to carry a subtle alternating electrical current, male and female in polarity. The clues lie in the design of the arches. Five, the pentagram, is associated with feminine or negative polarity, and six, the hexagram, male or positive polarity. Consequently, an initiate walking the cloisters would effectively open his body's alternating electrical circuit in preparation for receiving the beneficial energies congregating at the altar, a technology once employed in Egyptian temples. Construction of the buildings was overseen by Freemasons adepts who understood the effects of sound. Their name, Masson, means sound of Mother Earth. Like the Templars, the Mason's craft originates from the Egyptian mystery schools. Not surprising then, that they were employed to manifest the knight's sacred blueprints. The materials were carefully chosen. Limestone, a rock associated with water and the properties of female energy. And granite, a firestone with male energy. Consequently, the buildings are charged with positive and negative polarity, just like an electrical circuit.